We are beginning now a verse-by-verse study through the book of Joshua, which is really an amazing and important book of the Bible. If we want to consider something about the book of Joshua, we should begin by thinking about the historical setting of this book. If you want to go back to the book of Genesis, in chapter 12, we see that God made a covenant with Abraham, and that covenant was passed on to Isaac, Abraham's son, Jacob, Isaac's son, and then the 12 sons of Jacob, that is Israel, because Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. The covenant that God made with Abraham and his covenant descendants, because it was not with Abraham alone, but all those who would be his covenant descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 tribes that came from Jacob or Israel. That promised those covenant descendants a land, a nation, and a blessing, and that blessing would extend to all nations. That blessing would be fulfilled in the person, the ministry, the work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, not only of Israel, but the Savior of the world. Now, in the time of Jacob and his sons, the family moved to Egypt. In Egypt, they were first received as honored guests because they were related to Joseph, who had saved not only Egypt, but the entire region from a terrible famine. But eventually, the people of Israel became slaves in Egypt. And after approximately 400 years, Israel was delivered from their slavery in Egypt. They were led by Moses, and the people of Israel left Egypt and came to Mount Sinai, where Israel received God's covenant. Now, Israel's deliverance from Egypt became the central act of redemption in the Old Testament. God often reminded Israel that he had delivered them from Egypt's bondage. Again and again and again, it's in the Old Testament, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God who delivered you from Egypt. And God instituted feasts among the people of Israel. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Tabernacles, these were all instituted to remind Israel of God's deliverance in the days of the Exodus. Now, the Exodus and everything associated with it, those were real historical events. But their meaning was greater than merely being past events. God spoke through history to give an example of a greater deliverance for his people that he would bring through the person and work of Jesus Christ. A greater deliverance from the bondage of sin through the new covenant, which is a better covenant, as the New Testament tells us very clearly. Now, the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai included his law, the system of sacrifice, and the choice of blessing or cursing for Israel. So Israel, after some 400 years in Egypt, most of it lived in slavery, came out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. They came through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and after a year at Mount Sinai, God offered Israel the opportunity to enter the land of Canaan by faith. They were supposed to trust in him to conquer the people of Canaan. All this happened at a place called Kadesh Barnea. And at Kadesh Barnea, when offered the opportunity to take the promised land by faith, Israel failed to take this opportunity. They refused to enter the land that God promised them. Instead, they declared their desire to return to Egypt. And because of Israel's unbelief and rebellion, God decreed that Israel would remain in the wilderness another 38 years until that generation of unbelief died and a new generation, a generation that would be willing to trust God to take Canaan, they would enter into the promised land. So through that 38 years, God miraculously sustained Israel in the wilderness until a new generation was ready to trust God's promise to take the land of Canaan. Now, the book of Joshua, that book that we're beginning now, our verse-by-verse study through, it's the story 
of this generation of faith actually taking the promised land. Now, understand this. The land of Canaan was a real place that the people of God conquered and possessed under the leadership of Joshua. However, in a spiritual sense, Canaan also represents the destination that God intends for his people, a place of promised rest. This is detailed quite specifically in the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, specifically in chapter 4. You see, as explained in Hebrews chapter 4, the land of Canaan does not represent heaven, but instead a place of rest and security that can be enjoyed by every believer under the new covenant. This is the promise of rest spoken of in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. The rest that remains for the people of God spoken of in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. And the rest that Joshua pointed towards but did not completely fulfill. That's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this. That great preacher of Victorian England said that Canaan, quote, is a far better emblem of that state and condition of soul in which a man is found when he has become a believer, and by believing has entered into rest, but not into an absolutely perfect deliverance from sin. You see, here's the point, is that we say, and the Bible, as a matter of fact, says, that Canaan does not symbolically reference heaven, because there's still battles to fight in Canaan. There's still failures to be experienced. There's still repentance to be made. None of that will be the experience of the saints that are glorified and resurrected in heaven, but it will be the experience of those who are in God's rest right here and now, yet nevertheless have to continue forward in the battle that God gives us. Now, in this sense, you could say that the book of Joshua relates to the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians describes a spiritual walk of promise, wealth, and security for the believer in Jesus Christ. And the book of Joshua is the story of God's material provision of his promise to Israel in the land of Canaan. And think about this for a moment. Even as the place where the law was given, you could call it the place of the law, that is Mount Sinai, and even as the wilderness was not intended to be the destination for Israel under the Old Covenant, so under the New Covenant, the law is not God's intended destination for his people. No, the abundant life God intends for his people is not found by focusing on the law, though it still has its important and rightful place in the life and the understanding of the believer. But instead, the foundation is not built on law, but the promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ, whom Joshua points to. That's something I want you to remember throughout all our time here in the book of Joshua. Please remember this. The Hebrew name Joshua translates as Jesus into the Greek language of New Testament times. You see, Joshua is an enduring picture or type of Jesus, leading God's people into the fulfillment of God's promises. Whatever Israel received in the promised land, they received through the hand of Joshua. And whatever believers receive from God in the new covenant is received through Jesus Christ, who it can truly be said he is our Joshua. I want to remind you again, the names are the same. Joshua, Yeshua, that's simply a Hebrew or Old Testament way of saying the name. Joshua is the Englishized, anglicized version of the Greek form of that name, of the form Joshua. All right, now, with that background, let's start getting into the book of Joshua verse by verse. We're starting at Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Let me read that to you. 
After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, stop right there. Please notice the first few words of the book. After the death of Moses. Moses was indeed the great servant of the Lord and a leader of Israel. His death was recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 34. And as great as Moses was, and you would have to agree, he's one of the great men of the Bible, indeed of all history, Moses would never lead the people of God into the land of promise. That wasn't Moses' job, not his role, not his calling. That was for Joshua, his successor. Nevertheless, Moses died. I think of something that Alexander McLaren said, You've heard me reference Charles Spurgeon many times. Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher of Victorian England. Alexander McLaren was a contemporary of Spurgeon's and also had a church in London. Alexander McLaren said this, No man is indispensable. God's work goes on uninterrupted. The instruments are changed, but the master hand is the same and lays one tool aside and takes another out of the tool chest as he will. Well, that's exactly what he did in reference to Moses. Moses was a valuable and important tool in the hand of the Lord, but he set Moses aside and picked up Joshua now to continue his work. However, notice this phrase used of Moses in verse 1. It describes him as Moses, the servant of the Lord. That phrase, servant of the Lord, is used of Moses at least 12 times in Joshua. It's used of Joshua himself only once, at the end of the book, chapter 24, verse 29, if you're interested. Abraham and David also received this honored title, the servant of the Lord. And once Moses had died, then verse 1 tells us, the Lord spoke to Joshua. Now, Joshua, who by no means was a young man at this time, he was an old man. He had spent his entire career previously as the assistant of Moses. Joshua found that now it was his time to lead, but only after God had prepared him. You see, Joshua previously in his career, some 40 years before this, was the leader of the group of 12 spies that Moses sent into Canaan before Israel's first opportunity to enter the promised land. That's back in Numbers chapter 13. You see, the Numbers 13 passage explains that Joshua was originally named Hosea. Uh, that means salvation. But Moses changed his name to Yahshua or Yahoshua, meaning Yahweh is salvation. And among those 12 spies, only Caleb and Joshua returned from the land of Canaan with a faith-filled report, confident that God would empower Israel to overcome the challenges in the conquest of Canaan. Because of their faithfulness, Joshua and Caleb were the only adult Israelites of the generation that left Egypt to survive the wilderness years and to enter into the land of Canaan. Numbers chapter 14, verse 30 makes that very clear. You see, some 38 years before the events of Joshua chapter 1, Joshua believed God would work through Israel to give them the land. And he still believed it. Moses was not allowed to lead Israel into the promised land because of a specific occasion of disobedience. But now Joshua will lead them in. This um, wonderful truth that we remind ourselves of, that the conqueror of Canaan, Joshua, and the redeemer of the world, Jesus Christ, they bear the same name. The Jesus whom we trust, he was a Joshua. Now again, get back to who Joshua was. Verse 1 tells us that he was Moses' assistant. You see, at God's command, 
Moses had already formally recognized Joshua as his successor to lead Israel. That was back in Numbers chapter 27. Now, though Joshua was not of noble birth, nor was he a literal son of Moses, there were many things that qualified Joshua to be the successor of Moses. Joshua had a great training from the Lord to do this great task of leading Israel into Canaan. If you go back to Exodus chapter 16, Joshua had led the army of Israel against the Amalekites. Uh, Exodus chapter 24 tells us that Joshua was an assistant to Moses. Exodus chapter 33 tells us that Joshua helped Moses at the tabernacle after the golden calf disaster. Numbers chapter 11 tells us that Joshua was zealous to preserve the authority and leadership of Moses. Numbers chapter 13 and 14 tells us that Joshua was one of the two faith-filled spies among the total of 12 who spied out the land of Canaan. Numbers chapter 27 tells us that Joshua was a man in whom is the Spirit of God. Again, that's Numbers chapter 27, verse 18, which is perhaps the most important qualification of all. The Holy Spirit would have to empower Joshua and enable him to fulfill this challenging role of leading the nation of Israel into the land of Canaan. You see, when we consider all the steps and stages that God brought Joshua through before, we see that God used the consistent, demonstrated faithfulness of Joshua in many small things to prepare him for this essential role of leading Israel into the land of Canaan, because it was a land with strong enemies who were, of course, reluctant to leave their land. I like what James Montgomery Boyce, in his wonderful commentary on the book of Joshua, has to say about this man. Let me read this to you, quoting, Joshua was a soldier. He was a brilliant soldier, one of the most extraordinary military commanders of all time. But he was not an exciting person, as far as we can tell. He was probably just a bit of a plugger, a rather straightforward man who was chiefly concerned with carrying out his divine commission to the letter. He had no great sins and made very few mistakes. In short, he was not the kind of person who would make a good hero for a novel. Yet, Joshua was eminently God's man. Yes, he was. And as we continue on here in Joshua chapter 1, we're going to see more about this. Now, uh, starting at verse 2, we're going to read verses 2 and 3 here. This is what God said to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Again, I want to emphasize what the Lord first said to Joshua in verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. God recognized the transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. Moses had been appropriately mourned. You could read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 34. But now it was time to look ahead to the new work that God would do through Israel's new leader. I like what G. Campbell Morgan had to say about this. He said, quote, God's instruments are men, and high indeed is the honor of being such. Each will take up a work already begun, and each will leave it unfinished. Each is a debtor to those who have gone before, and a creditor to those who will follow. Therefore, it behooves us to be filled with humility and restfulness. Do you see the point that G. Campbell Morgan was trying to make there? It's as if he recognizes that Joshua and every servant of the Lord is taking part in a relay race. He received a baton from Moses, and he's going to pass that baton off to somebody else. That's how it is for every one of us. So we should be humble. We should be filled with faith. 
And again, I think it's fascinating that here they were ready to go on this great work that God would enact through the nation of Israel and as they would head on. Now, in these few verses, verses 2 and 3 that I just read to you, and on into verse 4 as well, it actually gives us an outline of the book of Joshua. In verse 2, the phrase is used, go over this Jordan. That was God's instruction to Joshua. So, in the first five chapters of the book of Joshua, we have the crossing of the Jordan. Then it says in verse 2, the land which I am giving. That's the Lord giving the land to the people of Israel. Starting in the middle of Joshua chapter 5, we have the conquest of the land of Canaan. And that continues on in through chapter 12. Then the boundaries of the land that are going to be discussed in verse 4, which I'll read to you in just a moment, that implies the distribution of the land that takes place in chapters 13 through 22. Again, God says, send them into the land which I am giving to them. That's the phrase in verse 2. Now, God had promised this land to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to the sons of Israel. Uh, these promises are very prominent in the book of Genesis. Look, I, I can count many times where this promise of God giving them a land is repeated. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 3, chapter 12, verse 7, chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, chapter 15, verse 7, chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, chapter 17, verse 8, chapter 24, verse 7, chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, chapter 28, verses 3 and 4, chapter 28, verses 13 and 14, chapter 35, verses 9 through 13, chapter 48, verses 3 and 4, and chapter 50, verse 24. Those are all just in the book of Genesis. Again and again and again, God repeated his promise to give the land of Canaan as an inheritance to the covenant descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But by title deed, you could say by legally recognized title, the people of Israel had never possessed any of the land of Canaan except the burial place of the patriarchs in Hebron. That's described in Genesis chapter 23. They lived, Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, uh, Isaac lived in the land of Canaan, Jacob lived for some of the time in the land of Canaan, but they lived as sojourners, uh, traveling, uh, Bedouins, traveling herdsmen. They didn't actually own any of the land except the burial place of the patriarchs in Hebron. And they had not had any presence in the land of Canaan for about four hundred years, all that time they were in Egypt. Yet it was the land that God had promised to Israel, so now he was going to give it to them. Now, notice in verse 3, God says to Joshua, I have given you the land. You see, the whole land was given to Joshua and to Israel, but they could only possess what they would claim. Verse 3 says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread. God gave it, but they had to possess it. What they possessed would have to be fought for against a determined opposition. I want you to think about this. God states it in the singular in verse 3. Speaking of the whole land of Canaan, he speaks to Joshua and he says, I've given you this land. It's as if God says, Joshua, you have this land and you will distribute it to Israel. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, applying this spiritually speaking. Even as the inheritance of Canaan was entrusted to a leader, a representative, so it is true for God's people under the new covenant. All they spiritually possess, they have in Jesus Christ, who is both their leader and their representative. But make no doubt about it, Israel could only possess the land as God worked in them and through them. They could never conquer Canaan in their own wisdom and strength, yet God would not eliminate their enemies, 
as Israel just sort of passively sat by. No, God called Israel into partnership with him to see his will done. I like what F.B. Meyer had to say about this. He said, quote, all the land was given, but every inch of it had to be claimed. Israel had to put her foot down upon the land, whether wilderness or Lebanon, plain or hill, and say, this is mine by the gift of God. And as the right was asserted, God made it good. But because taking the land would take effort, the challenge ahead of them and the conquest of Canaan was not for those who would be content to live in Egypt, not for those who would be content to live in the wilderness. No, it was for those who would press ahead for what God had called them to possess. Now let's begin at verse 4. Here's God going to promise victory to Joshua and to Israel, uh, continuing in these words that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Uh, here, verse 4 and 5. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. In these verses, God describes the precise territory of the land that God gave of Israel. Uh, a couple of the markers mentioned in verse 4, from the wilderness as far as the great river. This specific geographical boundary is evidence that this was not a spiritual land that God gave to Israel. There's definitely a spiritual aspect involved. But this was a material land. It had real wilderness, real mountains, real rivers, real earth. And we also see that even though this refers to a literal land, for us as believers under the New Covenant, it has a spiritual application. As God promised to Joshua, verse 5, as I was with Moses. Now again, Moses was one of the great men of the Bible. He had a very important role in God's unfolding plan of the ages. But the work of Moses was now finished, and now the work of Joshua would begin. And again, do not miss this correlation. Moses, who represented the law, could not lead Israel into the promised land. Miriam, who you could say represented the prophets, because on at least occasion she prophesied. Miriam could not lead God's people into the promised land. Aaron, the brother of Moses, Miriam was the sister of Moses, so you have Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. Aaron, who represented the priesthood, could not lead Israel into the promised land. Only Joshua, that is Jesus, could lead them into the land of God's promise. And he does this based on a promise, the promise of his presence. Did you see that phrase in verse 5? The Lord spoke to Joshua and said, I will be with you. You see, Israel was assured of success in this venture, not because it was easy. It wasn't easy at all. It was a very difficult thing to conquer the land of Canaan. And not because Joshua was a great leader or because Israel was a great nation. No, they would triumph because God is a great God. And the Lord himself promised Joshua, I will be with you. Friends, that is enough for anybody who seeks to do God's will. You see, we need to understand and embrace the presence of the Lord. You see, I will not leave you nor forsake you. God said that to all Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 5. And it's also quoted later on in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, applying that to all believers. God speaking to us, speaking to his people, saying, I am with you. 
as Jesus promised to his disciples before he left the earth and ascended to heaven. He said, Behold, I am with you even unto the end of the age. Dear brother or sister in Christ, that is our confidence. It's no confidence in our own strength, our own wisdom, our own power, but rather in the promise that Jesus Christ will be with his people, even as the Lord promised to be with Joshua. Right now, starting at verse 6, going on to verse 9, I'm going to read to you these verses that describe the conditions God makes for the promise of victory. We saw that God promised them victory, but there were conditions to this promise. Look now, starting at verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, God specifically, pointedly, and repeatedly gave Joshua a command to be bold in the Lord. Did you see that phrase in verse 6? Be strong and of good courage. And the emphasis that's given to this command, uh, repeated at least four times just in the first chapter of the book of Joshua, this suggests that Joshua needed this strong encouragement. He would need God's strength. He would need God's courage to conquer Canaan and to divide the land as an inheritance in Israel. You see, the sense here is that Joshua would find this strength and this courage in Yahweh. He wouldn't find it in himself. As the Apostle Paul would later explain in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Joshua was to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And friends, that's a pattern for believers, to find their strength in God and not in self. And that is exactly what Joshua needed to do. Now, verse 7 gives another condition. Okay, Joshua, you got to be strong. you got to find your strength, your boldness in the Lord. But secondly, now, in verse 7... It says that you may observe to do according to all the law. Now, as a people, Israel was bound to God in covenant. That covenant at Mount Sinai is recorded in Exodus chapter 24. And a significant part of that covenant was God's promise to bless an obedient Israel. Uh, you can find those promises of blessing in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. But God also promised to curse a disobedient Israel. You can find those promises to curse in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28. When Israel and their leadership did, as verse 7 says, according to all the law, then they were invincible with God's blessing and strength. You see, you could say, that what God promised Joshua in Israel right here in Joshua chapter 1 was the repeating of a promise that God made to Israel previously at Mount Sinai. There, God promised to defeat the Canaanites and to give Israel their land. Let me read to you Exodus chapter 23, verse 22, where it says this, that if Israel would obey him, if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. <laughs> Friends, wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love God to be a strong enemy against your enemies, a strong adversary to your adversaries? That's what God promised to do for an obedient Israel. That's why it was important for them to not, as verse 7 says, 
Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. There's going to be an extreme on either side that you can fall off to, but don't turn. Instead, put your focus on obeying what is written. Verse 8 here in Joshua chapter 1 says, in this book of the law. Now, since obedience to God's law was required for Israel's success, it was very important for them to know and to value God's word. You see, it wasn't only Joshua that needed to read God's word. Uh, he needed to have it more than just read. It had to be on his lips. Verse 8 says, it shall not depart from your mouth. It, it had to be in his mind. Uh, verse 8 says, you should meditate in it day and night. And then Joshua also had to do it. Verse 8 says that he had to observe to do according to all that is written. You, you see, he didn't only need to read it. He had to speak it, think it, and do it. Now, Joshua would have a copy of the law, according to the law of Moses, laid up in the sanctuary. But he had to have that copy for himself, and he needed to read it, speak it, meditate on it, and do it constantly. Now, I, I love what John Trapp, the old Puritan commentator, said about Joshua at this point. Noting Joshua's ability as a soldier, John Trapp said this, that Joshua was a book man as well as a sword man. Friends, what a great thing to have said about a man or a woman of God, that they are a book man as well as a sword man. I, I don't know what it is that you do for a living. Uh, if you're a mechanic, is you hold a wrench, you turn a wrench. Well, it's fine for you to be a wrench man, but you need to be a book man as well. Um, you're a chef in a restaurant. You, you work with a saucepan all the time. Great that you're a saucepan man, but you also need to be a book man man. You need to be a man or woman of God's word. So friends, they had God's word. They appreciated God's word. They regarded it as God's word, and they truly received it and accepted this. And I want you to understand something. This is a great point brought up by Francis Schaeffer in his uh, commentary on Joshua, Joshua and the Flow of Biblical History. Schaeffer points out that Joshua was to regard the writings of Moses as, the phrase is used there, uh, the book of the law, he was to regard it as the words of God. And this was true even though Joshua knew Moses intimately. He knew his strengths. He knew his weaknesses. Joshua knew very well that Moses was a sinner and that Moses could make mistakes, yet he was to regard that what he received from Moses, the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, that he was to regard that as the words, not just of Moses, but as the words of God, the writing of God. This is very significant. So, uh, Joshua had to be bold, he had to be strong, he had to give obedience to God's word, and if he would do those things, he and the nation of Israel, then verse 8 says, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This promise to prosper and give success to an obedient Israel, that just simply repeats themes that God had previously spoken to Israel. Again, uh, we saw it in Leviticus chapter 26, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God promised Israel, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, I'll curse you. Obey God, Israel, and you'll be blessed, and you can take Canaan, the promised land. That was God's message to Joshua and Israel here in Joshua chapter 1. Now, under the new covenant, that's what the community of Jesus Christ, the church, Christians, the new covenant community, that's what we live under. Under the new covenant, God's people are not blessed primarily because of their obedience, but because of their relationship of love and trust in Jesus Christ. Yet, 
because God's commands are inherently good and wise, you could say that there is a built-in blessing when we conform to this good and wise design of the plan of God. There is great blessing for the believer in knowing and in obeying God's word. And God spoke another great word to Joshua here. I'm going to conclude this here in verse 9, even though we got the rest of the chapter to go. Verse 9, it says, For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, that final encouragement is repeated from verse 5. It reminds us that Joshua's success did not depend solely on his ability to keep God's word. The, the presence of God with him was an even greater factor. All right, let's pick it up here now at verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people. Notice this. Joshua had received his instructions from the Lord. Now he's passing it on to the people. Let me begin again, verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now, Israel had arrived at this general area that is the eastern side of the Jordan River, back in Numbers chapter 20. They were there for the book of Numbers, chapter 20 to the end of the book. They were there for all the book of Deuteronomy, and now they're there for the first chapter of the book of Joshua. And after remaining at that place, the plains of Moab, on the east side of the Jordan River for this extended period, now Israel was about to cross over this Jordan and enter the land of Canaan. So he speaks to the officers of the people. That's what the description there is in verse 10. These leaders, probably military leaders, hey, get ready. We've got to get the people ready. We've got to get the army ready. Here we go. We're going to go in to possess the land. That's what it says there in verse 11, to possess the land. And this possession was going to come by conquest. Friends, the land of Canaan was not empty. And the people who lived there weren't just going to give most of the land to the people of Israel. Now, the wars of conquest against the Canaanites began way back in Numbers chapter 21 with the victory over Arad the Canaanite. That's where it began. But most of the fighting was ahead of Israel. You see, ahead of Israel were many battles with the Canaanites in order that they would take the land that God promised to Israel. And they were called to carry out a unique war of judgment against the Canaanites. You see, the tribal groups of Canaan were a particularly sinful and depraved people whom God literally gave hundreds of years to repent, as indicated by Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 16. And just as God would sometimes later use other nations to bring judgment against Israel, so in this period, uniquely, the Lord used his people to bring judgment against the Canaanites. This was a great work that they were to do. Now, Joshua spoke to the officers in verses 10 and 11. Now, starting at verse 12, he's going to speak to the eastern tribes. Let me read these verses, and then I'll explain what that means. Starting here at verse 12. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. 
Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you, and on this side of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Verse 12, Joshua addresses the leaders of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. You see, these were the tribes that chose to settle on the eastern side of the Jordan. This was land that Israel had already conquered. And these two and a half tribes had promised to cross over and help the rest of the nation take the land on the west side of the Jordan River. That was back in Numbers chapter 32. But here, Moses, excuse me, Joshua calls them to obey their prior commitment. That's why he says in verse 14, But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them. Again, that was to be a fulfillment of the promise that they made back in Numbers chapter 32. Even though those tribes already occupied their own land on the eastern side of the Jordan, they were to help their brothers who had yet to conquer their lands. Friends, this same principle operates in the body of Christ, among the community of Christians. When one member has a need, it's the common need of the body. Believers should never refuse to help a brother or a sister in need because their own state is settled. The, the two and a half tribes on the eastern side of the Jordan could say, hey, we've got our land, good luck with your own. No. The need of the tribes on the western side of the Jordan was a need for all of Israel. And even those who had already occupied their land, they were obliged to send over their fighting men to help with the conquest. Now, what would be the response of the eastern tribes? Here we go, starting at verse 16. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command as it does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Don't you find it wonderful that the response of these two and a half eastern tribes, in verse 16, they respond to Joshua and they say, all that you command us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we're going to go there. That was a display of unity in Israel that would be essential for them to fulfill God's calling and promise for them. They overcame the temptation to see the eastern tribes as something separate from the rest of Israel. And therefore, the leaders of those eastern tribes promised, verse 17, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. The willingness of the people to receive Joshua as their leader is really notable here. I mean, Moses was a great man, a great leader with a tremendous track record. They had trusted in Moses' leadership for some 40 years. Now they look at Joshua and go, we know you're God's man. We'll follow you the same way. But I also love this, that the representatives from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh also encouraged Joshua. They spoke to him the same thing that Joshua had previously heard from the Lord. They said to him in verse 18, only be strong and of good courage. So God himself encouraged Joshua with those words previously in this chapter. Now the people of God echo it and they say, Joshua, what the Lord told you to do, do it. And this is an example of God's people encouraging one another with God's word. It's not a marvelous thing that we can do. These leaders of the Eastern tribes, they said, Joshua, we're going to encourage you with what the Lord spoke to you. We're going to repeat God's word to you and encourage you with that. What a great thing we can do with our Bibles, with the word of God. We can encourage one another with God's promises. Friends, I hope you take the promises of God for yourself, but don't be selfish with them. You can share them, encourage others with them as well.
Now, before we leave Joshua chapter 1 here, let's consider just a few ways that Joshua 1 points to Jesus Christ. I'm not going to pretend for a moment that just the couple points I'm going to give you right now exhaust how this chapter points to Jesus. Uh, and if you have additional thoughts beyond what I share here just in the next few moments, uh, we invite you to give a response in some way or another. But check it out here. I thought of just a couple ways that Joshua 1 points to Jesus Christ. Number one, obviously. Joshua represents Jesus Christ leading his people into God's promised land of rest and security. There's still going to be battles to be fought, but there is a place of inheritance, a place of security for the people of God. That's number one. Number two, uh, I want you to see a contrast here. Moses was the leader who died. <laughs> that idea is repeated twice in the first couple verses. Moses was dead. But Jesus is the leader who never dies. Do you see the contrast? Moses passes away, but not Jesus. It, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16, says that Jesus serves his people not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. That's our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, the writer of the Hebrews says that Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Aren't you grateful that God's never going to pass us off to another Savior, another Redeemer, a, a replacement? No, 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 no. In God's work among men, the baton gets passed, but not with our Savior. Moses was the leader who died. Jesus is the leader who never dies. And then finally, I don't know if you noticed this when we read verse 11, but Joshua told the people of Israel, hey, we're going to cross over in three days. Think about that, three days. God promised a new beginning for Israel, crossing the Jordan and entering into Canaan. And that points to a completely new beginning that God had for Israel back then, but for all his people. You could even say for all creation, in the three days between the death of Jesus and his glorious resurrection. Listen, after Jesus Christ died on the cross, in three days, God made all things new. Because everything that comes with the newness of life, both for individual believers and creation as a whole, comes in and through the glorious resurrection of Jesus, which happened in three days, three days after his death. Now, there's just a couple ways I can think that Joshua chapter 1 points to Jesus Christ. We're going to see a lot more as we continue on in our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Joshua. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. And we ask, Lord, that we would look to Jesus Christ as our Joshua, our conqueror, the leader whom we will follow, the leader whom we will obey so that we can honor you and give you glory, and that we can possess everything that you have for us in Jesus Christ. Work that in us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.